has to be said that if you were to pick 10 issues of Marvel Team Up that featured a top-notch selection of Marvel's A-list superheroes, this isn't the 10 to pick. But don't leave, there's still some material of interest here, including Spider-Man leaving to join the most famous event in comic book history. Ah, now you're interested. We begin this episode with issue 131, and a team up with Frogman. You see what I mean about the standard of guest star? And this ain't the worst of it. What's it say here? Oh, okay. This is the first of a two-parter by regular writer Jame DeMattis, who had been the scribe now for over 20 issues, and artists Sal Buscema and Mike Esposito. Although Mike was a mainstay on the title, Sal was making a guest appearance, sticking around long enough only to complete this storyline. Old Big Brain is working in the lab when he has a visitor in the form of a guy called Larry. Now Larry refers to Reed as Uncle Reed because his father and Reed Richards go back a long way. In fact, Reed was with his father the night that Larry was born. Now it may sound like a good thing having a visit from someone that you see uh, as a kind of a, a nephew. However, the last time that Reed saw Larry, he'd been committed to a mental institution after taking on the persona of every man kind of a superhero, he thought, and uh, Larry thought he was fighting a noble fight on behalf of the common man, the common woman. However, in the course of being every man, he killed three cops. And in the end, it took Captain America to stop him. So he was committed to that mental institution, but he seems to be a lot better now though. Oh, maybe not. In fact, it doesn't take long for it to become clear that Larry's back to his old ways because as Reed returns from the kitchen with a drink for him, he sees Larry standing there wearing a featureless mask. And he says that wearing that featureless mask, he could be any man or possibly every man. However, not only does he not look the same as every man as he did before, which looking at his previous outfit is a blessing, but his power set is very different. He's now super strong. But Reed says to him, you may have the raw power, son, but I have years of hard-won experience. I've held my own against Doctor Doom, the Hulk, and the Thing himself. Now I know that Reed and the Thing are good buddies, but you wouldn't place the Thing higher up uh, on that bill than the Hulk. Then, during the scuffle, Reed says, we can waste our time in needless battle, or we can talk. Needless battle, needless battle. Luckily for us, that's exactly what Larry wants as well. And after kicking Reed off, he shoots him with the device he's brought with him. And that causes unimaginable pain uh, to Reed. So much so that he falls unconscious and is still lying unconscious uh, over 40 minutes later when our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man happens to swing by the Baxter building. Apparently Spider was visiting the Baxter building to find out how the Fantastic Four survive without having jobs. But as he approached uh, the window, he saw Reed's motionless body uh, lying on the floor of the lab. And he recognised him, despite him wearing a new costume. Well, he should, because you can still see his face. But yes, these are the uh, new costumes at this point that had been introduced by John Byrne during his run on the Fantastic Four comic. It was only really a change in the colour scheme from the old light blue and black, but I think it was an effective change nonetheless. So Spidey helps Reed uh, regain consciousness Meanwhile, we see that every man is out giving a speech to the masses to try to win them over. But it doesn't really work. They think he's just another loon. And a police officer approaches him and says, all right, Hamlet, soliloquy's over. And now we see that every man really is back to his old ways because he doesn't hesitate uh, to hit the police officer with his newfound super strength. Now, some people in the crowd are happy with that because they're anti-establishment, but the vast majority are shocked and disgusted by it and begin to leave. And he gets desperate and says, no, don't go, I beg you. I only want to help you, to show that you don't have to accept the status quo. Come back, please. And then he realizes the only way that he can stop them from running away, the way that he can maybe uh, make them accept him, to be closer to them, is to use that gun again, the one that he used on Reed. And it's got a name, it's the Absorber Scan. And it's called the Absorber Scan because when he fires it at people, uh, it kind of absorbs their essence and certainly their strength and adds to his strength. 
He says the doctor gave him that gun. And using it on the crowd means that he's now stronger than ever. And that's quickly shown as he effortlessly picks up a police car and throws it at nearby cops. Back at the Baxter building, we see that the absorber scan didn't just momentarily rob Reed of some of his strength, but it has permanently robbed him of his intellect. And he now decries the fact that he considers himself to be ordinary because although he can still stretch his body into bizarre shapes, he always considered that to be kind of his secondary power to his intellect. But Spider-Man convinces him that the two of them can go and find Larry and turn things around, defeat Larry and somehow restore Reed's intelligence. But in losing part of his intelligence, Reed also has lost a bit of his tactical nous and he proves to be not particularly helpful during the fight. Spider-Man wraps Larry up in webbing, but Larry, as I said, is now so strong that the webbing can't hold him. We interrupt the fight for a brief visit uh, to the doctor. And if it is Doctor Doom, and don't tell me you weren't thinking that, then he's certainly changed his style. Back at the fight, Reed is still not really proving himself uh, much use. So Spidey is doing all the heavy lifting. However, all of a sudden, he feels weak. And that's because every man has set the absorber scan to carry on absorbing everyone's strength, even Spider-Man's, during the fight. And there's a classic Sal Buscema illustration here, because he always has loved uh, showing people after they get punched uh, upside down, basically, face first towards us, the viewer. And it seems that every man has won, because as he says, he's showed them, he showed them all that the common man uh, cannot be stopped. But Reed knows differently. He says, you fool, you've showed them nothing. Because all this time, the way that he has got his strength, the way he's been able to fight and defeat Reed and Spider-Man, is by draining the strength, the health of the common man and the common woman. And then Reed takes it a step further by telling Larry that he's killing those common people, the people that he thought he was fighting for. And seeing this, realizing the truth of what Reed is saying, Larry falls to pieces. There's another little mention of the doctor, but he says, what can I do, Uncle Reed, what can I do? And Reed says, run away, far away from everyone, so your energy draining field won't uh, drain the life force of these normal everyday people that you want to protect so much. So Larry does, he hightails it out of there. Slowly but surely the people recover, and then Spider-Man says to Reed, right, let's work together on trying to reverse the effects of the absorber scan on you. Let's try and get your intellect back. Reed isn't very confident. He doesn't think he now has the intellectual ability to do it, but Spidey not only helps him, but he encourages him. He says, come on, Reed, you can do it. We, we can work this out together. Eventually, they create a, a prototype, and Reed says, test it on me. So Spidey shoots him with the prototype, and indeed, his intellect does return. But this isn't over yet. Because as Reed says, someone out there has been playing dangerous games with poor Larry's life and mine, and I'm not going to rest until I've found that someone. Q issue 133 with a brilliant Al Milgram cover. And the cover claims that it's a team up between Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four. But initially, at least, Reed insists this is something he has to do for himself, to get answers from the institution. So he takes a fantastic car on his own uh, to the institution where Larry had been held. And at this point, we finally meet the Doctor, who was referred to a couple of times in the previous issue. It isn't, definitely isn't Doctor Doom. His name is Johann, Johann Faustus, AKA Dr. Faustus. He has been a longtime friend of uh, Hydra and the Secret Empire, but he's struggling to get the respect uh, of the woman he loves, Anna. And we see him say here, please do not mock me, Anna. You know that what I do, I do for you. And she says, indeed, and you have never pleased me. Just dump her, blimey. Don't need it, mate, don't need it. At that point, the Fantastic Heart arrives in the grounds uh, of the institution. And as Reed leaves it, he sees that Spider-Man had hitched along for the ride. And after a somewhat clumsy entrance, he explains to Reed 
that after he left the Baxter building, he realised he couldn't let Reeves do this uh, on his own. They are, after all, friends, and friends help each other out. So Reed says, OK, fair enough. At that point, as they're peering through the foliage uh, at the institution, who should appear but the human torch? Although, again, he also is uh, very clumsy and crash lands into a tree. And Spidey points out to Reed uh, that Reed had said the rest of the team were off on personal business, so how comes uh, the human torch is there? And Reed says, yes, they were, but look, we'll deal with that later. For now, let's, let's help him out because he's clearly in a bad way. Um, and he asks Spidey to put out some of the fire because where the human torch has hit that tree has resulted uh, in some little bits of nearby foliage catching fire. Uh, so Spidey says, I think a little dirt will do the trick just as well as uh, his webbing would to put the fire out. All right, smart ass. Are you trying to save money on webbing or something? The human torch, meanwhile, is frantic. He explains that he was on a date, and during the date, he lost consciousness, and when he came to, he was at the institution and being operated on by people. Not only that, but those people who operated on him also have Ben, Sue, and even Reed's son, Franklin. Needless to say, this spurs Reed on more than ever to get into the institution, and he crashes through the front door with a rather groggy uh, human torch being carried along by Spider-Man. The first member of the team they find uh, in the building is the Thing, hung up by his ankles in chains. Spidey quickly frees him by breaking these chains, but Ben is just as groggy as the human torch is, and he soon falls over with a clunk. Clunk? It's an odd choice of sound effect. Anyway, this is placing more and more pressure on Reed to find Sue and his son. And this is also all being watched uh, on close circuit uh, TV, by Dr. Faustus and Anna. Dr. Faustus is loving it. He's saying, brilliant, things are going perfectly. At this rate, uh, the secret empire will be happy to, to take me back uh, into their ranks. Anna isn't quite so uh, convinced. She says, you are so clever, Johan. You are always so very, very clever. But how many times have I told you, cleverness is not enough. Think back, idiot. Oh, she's such a bitch. The thing she wants him to think back about uh, is his childhood uh, in Vienna when the Nazis invaded and his father was very clever, but his father died during the invasion. His mother was also very clever, but she ended up um, dying as she slaved away to support him, Johann, uh, with his um, lofty, dreamy ambitions. Spidey and the Fantastic Three, meanwhile, uh, are searching for Sue. And whilst they're doing that, Reed has a splitting headache, briefly. And it's one he's already had um, earlier on during this visit. Then Spidey leaps up and sticks with his back uh, to the ceiling, saying that his spider sense is picking up the fact that there's something behind that door that is very interesting. So the thing goes up with a few bashes, um, breaks down the door. And beyond it, it's Susan Storm, the invisible girl. Because although John Byrne has changed the Fantastic Four's outfits, he hasn't yet upgraded um, the Invisible Girl to the Invisible Woman, which he would uh, shortly after this. She seems to be suffering something uh, of a mental breakdown. In fact, the whole team seem to be crushed. And at that point, who enters the scene but none other than Doctor Doom? And he's got Franklin Richards with him as well. And again, this pushes Reed even closer to the edge as he shouts, Doom, you maggot! Get your stinking hands away from my son! He reaches up towards him. Again, he's feeling that pain in his head, but he also hits an invisible force field that stuns him and sends him um, limp to the floor. Limp, but conscious. And whilst he's laying there, Dr. Doom gives uh, a grand speech about how he has defeated the whole of the Fantastic Four. And he unmasks himself. And we see underneath the mask, it's Reed! And now with a flick of the switch, um, lights, sounds, uh, sensations pound all of the heroes. The invisible girl tries to protect Reed with one of her invisible force fields, but that is quickly shattered. And then as quickly uh, as this uh, psychological, um, sensorial bombardment began, it ends. And as it ends, one by one, Ben, the human torch, the invisible girl collapse dead 
But Reed's torment isn't over yet, because now a furious Franklin uh, approaches him and tells him that it's his fault that those friends of theirs, uh, members of their family, Franklin's mother, have died. And Spider-Man agrees, saying that Reed has failed miserably. Then Franklin whips out a gun that he had tucked in his belt. I'm serious. Whips out a gun that he had tucked in his belt, aims it at Reed and pulls the trigger. And Reed falls down dead. At that point, Dr. Faustus appears, triumphant. And things now begin to make sense. Because they weren't the other members of the Fantastic Four, they were androids, as was uh, the little android that was playing the role of Franklin Richards. Spider-Man, he wasn't an android, but he also wasn't Spider-Man. He's an imposter wearing Spider-Man's outfit and also has suckers uh, on his fingers and on his back. And that's what helped him stick to the walls and stick to the ceiling that time. Not only that, but maybe the oddest aspect of all of this is that Reed isn't dead because he wasn't shot with a bullet. Dr. Faustus says, the results could not have been better with real bullets in the gun. After all of the mental and emotional turmoil and anguish that the doctor had put Reed through, including those severe headaches, Reed's brain just couldn't cope with it anymore. It wanted death, it accepted death, and it switched off. And he's now left in a vegetative state. Anna then appears. And I love the way that uh, Dr. Faustus is holding Reed's neck here, by the way. And Anna says, you arrogant fool, you have proved nothing. You have failed me again. Dump her. Anyway, she's right. He has failed because Reed wasn't dead. He wasn't in a vegetative state. He was playing possum as all the best superheroes enjoy doing. He says that the uh, brainwave scrambler, that's the device that was causing those headaches, did uh, confuse him. And in his confused state, he wasn't paying close enough attention to clues that he would otherwise have noticed. And then there's a little box here that says, a no prize to the first reader who can compile a complete list of our sneaky clues. Okay, let's have a go. There's Spidey's clumsiness when he first arrived uh, in the institution. The Human Torch, although he was flamed on when we first saw him, that was it. We never saw him fly or flame on again after that point. And you remember Spidey when he's trying to save money on webs? Well, clearly he wasn't when he used the dirt to put out the fire. That was another clue. And then look at these strange webs that he was firing from his wrists uh, as he was swinging from the tree to the institution. There was the thing going clunk when he fell over because He's an android, so he's made of metal rather than a rock. And then sticking with the thing, there's the fact it took him three hits to break down a door that was just made of wood and steel. Beyond that door was the invisible girl. Well, she did turn invisible, but when she turned invisible, there was a strange kind of humming sound effect. And let's not forget that uh, in order to find her, Spider-Man claimed his spider sense was telling him there's something behind the door. Well, for a start, the spider sense only warns him of danger. Secondly, he said his spider sense was activated, but we certainly can't see the familiar uh, radiant shapes coming from his head. And then of course, there's that odd sound effect, the shoop as he hit the ceiling. Sue Storm's uh, invisible shield towards the end. Again, it hummed uh, when it was created, and then it shattered. Her shields don't shatter. If anything, they, they flicker and vanish, but they don't shatter. And it was thanks to that Susan Storm android that Reed finally realised what was going on. Because as he says, no matter how disoriented and pained he was, there is nothing in creation that would have convinced him that that android was his wife. And with that, we get another upside down Salbusima punch from Reed. Dr. Faustus has failed. Of course, it doesn't take long for Anna to appear and say, from this day forth, I curse you, I deny you, I abandon you. She dumps him. He should have got him first. Actually, there is one more little twist to this tale. Because Reed looks in the direction that Johan is looking, and he sees no one. 
Anna isn't there and she was never there because she's just a figment of Johann's imagination and she's the imagined embodiment of his mother. And just to prove this, Reed finds a little locket in Johann's hand and in it there's an inscription that says, to my beloved son, Johann, from your mother, Anna. And that wraps up what was a really enjoyable little tale. Was it a team up? No, not really. It was a Mr. Fantastic solo story with a cameo from the real Spider-Man at the very beginning. But nonetheless, it was an enjoyable tale. Next up in issue 134, we have, oh, Jack of Hearts. At least it is a step up from Frogman. And this actually led into the Jack of Hearts limited series. God knows how they wangled that one. James Dematis isn't even involved in this one. Instead, it's Bill Mantlo writing and Ron Friends holding the pencil. That same creative team stay on for the next issue, which features, ah, now we're talking, Kitty Pride. Despite Kitty's popularity from her very first appearance, she had something of an identity crisis, cycling through a number of aliases and costumes until settling on Shadow Cat and her blue costume in the mid-80s. At this point, she is known by the codename Ariel, but it's interesting to note that although she's referred to by that name inside this comic, on the cover, she's plain old Kitty Pride, highlighting the fact that Marvel had yet to cement her shifting superhero identity. After that little adventure with the Morlocks, we cycle through team-ups with Wonder Man and oh, Aunt May and Franklin Richards. This issue was released during Assistant Editors Month and as a result is humorous, allegedly. The premise of Galactus coming to Earth to make Franklin Richards his new herald is actually pretty awesome, although we do now know that Franklin is far too powerful to serve Galactus. But when Galactus accidentally gives the power cosmic to Aunt May, transforming her into Golden Oldie, and Franklin discovers that the most effective way of satisfying Galactus's hunger is with twinkles, yes, twinkles, not, you know, then it kind of loses its awesomeness. Now I know it's supposed to be fun, and in fairness, the last page where the whole story is revealed to be not just a dream, but an inception level Mobius strip of a dream that begins and ends with Galactus is quite funny. But don't tell Marvel I said that, or they might resurrect the idea. Oh, by the way, in case you were wondering, the comics during Assistant Editors Month weren't edited by the Assistant Editors at all. They were edited exactly the same as they were any other month. I guess the joke was on us, huh? Which brings us to issue 138 and a team up with the Sandman. Sandman is literally one of Spider-Man's oldest foes, debuting in issue four of The Amazing Spider-Man in 1963. As we all know, he then went on to become a recurring villain, not just for Spider-Man, but also for the Fantastic Four, where he was one quarter of the Frightful Four. But in the mid eighties, his character underwent a bit of a change. After escaping a brush with death, he decided to go straight. And that change started, well actually it didn't start here at all. It started here in issue 86 of Marvel 2 in 1. Tom DeFalco is the architect in this crossroads in the life of Flint Marco, a man who as writer and editor would get to know the character of Sandman very well. The artist is Ron Wilson. He had drawn more issues of this, the thing's very own team up comic than anybody else and would go on to draw nearly every issue of The Thing's first solo series. This issue features two tales, one guesting the impossible man, but we are more interested in the first. I admire the work that's gone into this cover, but I can't say that it would have motivated me to have grabbed a copy off of the shelf. After all, how interesting can it be to see two guys sharing some suds in a bar? You'd be surprised. Initially, we're with The Thing and Mr. Fantastic, uh, in the Fantastic Four's lab, and the thing is moving around a load of really heavy machinery uh, as Reed has a bit of a spring clean. But it's not the kind of thing that the thing enjoys doing, and he says, where are guys like Doc Doom and the Sandman uh, when I really need them? And that prompts Reed to explain that uh, Sandman isn't gonna cause them or anybody else any problems ever again. And that's because he met his apparent demise in Amazing Spider-Man issue 218. That was after he and Hydro Man had merged into a giant kind of mud monster. And then that mud monster met a very King Kong demise as it was hit by uh, the NYPD choppers 
that drops some kind of gas onto it, sucked the moisture out of it, and then that monster fell from the top uh, of a skyscraper to earth in all little chunks. And then the chunks and the uh, loose sand that, that, that fell from it was all swept up by the NYPD into a big truck and taken away. What we weren't told in that issue was that those granules, the sand, um, the, the, the chunks and lumps uh, were taken away to be experimented on uh, in a police lab. The experiments uh, proved fruitless and ultimately uh, the lab guys said, you know what, just, just dump it. We're not getting anywhere. Um, get rid of it. The sand was poured into canisters and it was indeed dumped. However, thanks to the last dose of radiation that uh, they were hit with uh, in that police lab, Hydroman and Sandman are finally able to emerge from the canister, are able to split uh, and return to their former states. Hydroman doesn't hang around, uh, he leaves, he wasn't happy being merged into that monster and he can't wait to get away from Sandman. Sandman also didn't enjoy the experience, but it has left him a bit more kind of unnerved uh, and unsure of himself. So after walking the streets and doing some heavy thinking, after um, stealing a disguise from a charity clothing bank, and after then uh, mugging some guy for 10 bucks, Sandman stops off uh, at a pub just to have a quiet drink. The bartender, however, recognizes him and calls the Fantastic Four. It's the thing that picks up and hearing uh, that someone that he knows is dead, he believes is dead, uh, is in a bar, he picks up on the word bar and says, I'll be right there, and makes his excuses to read and leaves. Naturally, the thing is shocked to discover that it is Sandman, and he expects a fight. But Sandman isn't expecting a fight, and he won't put up a fight. He'll go quietly. But he says, for old time's sake, why don't you join me for a quick beer? before we go. The Thing thinks that Sandman is usually so arrogant uh, and self-assured and he's never seen him down like this. So he says to him, you used to be such a tough guy, what's happened to you? And what we get then is the Sandman explaining his origin story basically. From growing up in a rough neighbourhood, to his father leaving him uh, and his mother, to the fact that the only things he could ever do uh, involved his physical strength, and that included playing uh, American football. But even then, he was kicked off the team because he once uh, took a bribe to throw a match. And during this story, The Thing is thinking, I never knew how much uh, we two had in common, because The Thing also grew up in a rough neighbourhood, and football provided him with a ticket out of that neighbourhood as well. Sandman then goes on to talk about how he earned money uh, from petty crime. How his girlfriend uh, ended up cheating on him with another member of his gang. And how ultimately he found himself in prison. Then came the day that he escaped from prison. And in escaping, he hid out uh, on a beach that had been fenced off from the public. He didn't know why at the time, but it turned out there was a military testing site. And whilst he was there, the military did uh, set off an experimental nuclear explosion. And after experiencing what felt like an eternity of burning pain, he recovered to discover that the molecules of his body had merged with the radioactive molecules of sand uh, on that beach. And from that day on, he was the Sandman. He says that he was a freak, a monster, and he had a hard time accepting that fact. Again, something that the thing relates to. So the thing says to him, so where do you go from here? And the Sandman says, to jail, I guess. But the thing has other ideas. He's leaving, but he's leaving the Sandman in the bar. And not only that, but he's gonna give him some money to buy a few more drinks on him. And the Sandman doesn't understand what's going on. But the thing says, look, you've had some bad breaks in life. According to authorities, you're dead. So it seems to me, that this is the ideal opportunity to have a second crack at life. You got a chance to start all over again with a clean slate. Don't make the same mistakes again. Don't fumble this ball. I'll be rooting for you. 
Comic book history is littered with examples of good guys going bad and bad guys going good. Sometimes the changes are so successful that it's hard to believe that things were ever any different. For example, Hawkeye's original incarnation as a villain. Most of the time, however, the change is temporary, and that would be no different in this case. However, what a compelling catalyst for personal change this story provided. He had a tough start in life. The decisions he made didn't make life any easier. And now the world believes him to be dead. So yes, why not try something different? We return to Marvel Team Up issue 138 to see if he can follow through on that intention. Again, Tom DeFalco is the writer, but this time it is Greg LaRock providing the artwork, along with regular Marvel Team Up Inca, Mike Esposito. What is curious to note is the continuity between the covers of this comic and the Marvel 2-in-1 issue. Sandman's image in the corner box is the same, although it has been cropped and his right hand tweaked poorly. Marvel created a special logo for Sandman's appearance in Marvel 2-in-1, and they used it again for this comic. And I know what you're thinking. They were released in quick succession, so of course they would use the same logo. However, they weren't. Ten months separates these two comics. So hats off to the ballpen for making an effort to keep them consistent, even though they couldn't decide whether the co-star was called Sandman or THE Sandman. In that Marvel 2-in-1 comic, one thing we didn't get when Sandman was uh, talking us through his origin story was a retelling of his first encounter with Spider-Man. But we get that here, courtesy of one of numerous flashbacks that Sandman has of the event. And it still makes me laugh to this day that Spider-Man defeated him by using a vacuum cleaner. I know it's an industrial strength vacuum cleaner, but even so. There have been a couple of changes in Sandman's life since he had that drink with the thing. He now uh, lives in a cheap motel and he's got a full-time job working in a factory. There have also been a couple of changes in the web slinger's life lately. The biggest one being that he's currently without his spider sense after the hobgoblin hit him with a gas that robbed him of that vital warning system. It comes into play here because as he's swinging through the rooftops of New York, uh, his web line snags on a loose roof tile that his spider sense would have warned him of. He recovers in time to avoid going splat on the pavement, but there is an onlooker who's quite disappointed that he didn't break his neck uh, during that fall. And he is Montana, one of the original members of the Enforcers who first appeared back in Amazing Spider-Man issue 10. Now he is making his way to a meeting with his former colleagues, the other Enforcers, and that has been called by the Arranger, the Kingpin's henchman. Now the Kingpin wants the Enforcers to run the Brooklyn arm of his extortion racket. But it's not just the old enforcers there, because there are also two new members. One is Hammer Harrison, a former professional boxer. The other is called Snake Marston, apparently the world's greatest contortionist, who uses his skills to wrap his body around people. There's a brief scuffle because the old enforcers say they don't need any, any new members, but that only really serves uh, to win over the likes of Ox, who enjoys a good fight. So these two new guys have proved that in his book, they're all right. So they agree to work for the Kingpin and carry out their new roles with gusto in the following days. Meanwhile, the Sandman has found new digs because he has rented out uh, the attic room uh, in a family home. And he announces himself on the doorstep as Sylvester Man. Sylvester Man. Sylvester Man. S Man. Ah. And he also says it now feels like he's really getting his life together. The father of the household runs his own uh, candy shop and one morning he forgets to take his lunch into work. So Sandman, wanting to help out, says, I'll take it in for you. But when he drops it off, he sees the enforcers, obviously carrying out their uh, extortion duties, are scaring off any potential business. Now he knows them because he worked with them uh, a long while ago, back in uh, Amazing Spider-Man issue 19. Inside, Sandman finds that because his landlord wouldn't pay them the extortion money, They've beaten him up, and he thinks they'll pay for this. Back in the family home where he is now living, the wife uh, and children uh, of his landlord are clearly upset about what's happened. And he sees this, the Sandman, and he realises that this is the kind of effect that the things he used to do has been having on people all these years, and it makes him feel sick. But, he says, the enforcers are going to feel worse. Speaking of the enforcers, 
they managed to nab Spider-Man whilst he's out web swinging. Because without his spider sense, he wasn't able to avoid uh, Montana's lariat. Naturally, a fight ensues, where Spidey takes on all five of the enforcers single-handedly. Literally, in one sense, because he thinks he sprained his right wrist uh, when he landed. Also, of course, he's without his spider sense, so he's at a real disadvantage. Nonetheless, he more than holds his own. That is, until Hammer Harrison uses what he calls his steel-plated gloves uh, to finally knock Spider-Man unconscious. Sometime later, the Sandman has finally tracked down the enforcers and he can't believe what he sees when he looks through the window of the warehouse where they're hiding out. Of course he has no love for Spider-Man, and he briefly considers uh, leaving him to his fate. But then he thinks, nah, who am I trying to kid? And he bursts in and says, back off, leave Spider-Man alone. Now Ox is clearly the most dangerous of the enforcers, but this is Sandman we're talking about, and it takes more than just raw strength to defeat him. And there's a great line from Sandman here too, when he says, I always thought that you were as stupid as you were strong, but nobody's that strong. Earlier on, we saw Reed Richards playing possum against Dr. Faustus. Now that's a phrase that I was introduced to through the medium of comics, and it's no surprise because heroes love playing possum. Case in point, Spidey has been playing possum all along. He wasn't unconscious, he was just gathering his strength. And now he's able to break free from his chains and help Sandman in the fight, although he can't work out why Sandman is helping him. The two of them easily defeat all of the new enforcers, but at the end of it, Spider-Man, obviously not knowing that Sandman is wanting to turn over a new leaf, says he can't let him go free. And Sandman says, look, surely we can come to some kind of an understanding. He explains that he isn't a criminal anymore, that he's trying to go straight and he just asks Spider-Man to give him a chance to prove himself. But Spider-Man, in a move that seems a bit douchebaggy, um, says no. And that's mainly because of his uh, overwhelming sense of responsibility, and he's afraid that if he does let Sandman go, and Sandman is lying, that someone will be hurt. At this point, the arranger decides to try to take out Spider-Man, bizarrely, with a hand grenade that he had in his suit pocket. He throws this at Spider-Man, but Sandman sees this, changes into sand, and smothers the grenade, taking the full force of the explosion. So he saved Spider-Man's life, and Spidey isn't even sure if Sandman survived that explosion, because he's now in uh, grains of sand that are spread far and wide. He webs up the arranger uh, and swings off, thinking maybe Sandman was telling the truth after all. We then see the grains of sand reform back into the Sandman because of course he has survived. He says he knows he still has a lot of challenges ahead of him in his new life, but he knows that he will make it someday, somehow. The end? No. The beginning. Oh, I've just got something in my eye. Um, there you go. Oh, it's gone now. It's gone. Uh, oh, uh, issue 139 sees the creative merry-go-round continue as writer Carrie Burkett and penciler Brian Postman stop by to bring us a tale guest starring Nick Fury. I know that Samuel L. Jackson has helped to contemporise the character, but I always feel that he's something of a leftover from a bygone age. I know some great creators have worked on him, not least Jim Steranko, but his look, his personality, his very essence always feel to me as though they are better suited to the gold or silver age rather than anything later. We finish off this batch of team-ups with a solid street-level adventure featuring the Black Widow. It's jointly written by a couple of chaps that we've already had dealings with, Bill Matlow and Tom DeFalco. Tom's regular artistic contributor, Ron Friends, provides the breakdowns for Marvel team-up regular Mike Esposito to finish. This issue is particularly significant because at the end of it, well, have a look for yourself. We have a rather cinematic beginning to this issue, as the lights go out across the city, and we see how various people, including emergency services such as hospitals and the police force, deal with the blackout. Our focus, however, falls squarely onto a pawnbroker, whose shop is being robbed by a group of looters who are taking advantage of the blackout. However, suddenly one light does shine on them. It's the spider signal. So what's better, the spider signal or the bat signal? I suppose they serve very different purposes. 
the bat signal is used uh, to get Batman's attention, whereas the spider signal is used by Spider-Man to troll thieves and baddies, I suppose. Spidey sets about dealing with the looters, who naturally think that they can succeed where various supervillains from the past have failed by taking Spider-Man down. Of course, they're wrong, and he deals with them without even breaking into a sweat. Before the pawnbroker decides he wants to mete out his own form of justice, and he reappears armed with a shotgun. Before Spider-Man is able to de-escalate this new situation, some unseen person in the crowd has brought their own gun and they shoot the pawnbroker. And he will never again see the lights of New York City. Power was restored overnight and the next morning sees the Black Widow slicing her way through the New York skies. She is on her way to give her friend Matt Murdock some much needed moral support as he, along with other lawyers, uh, struggles to cope with the uh, overflow of cases that came from that power cut the previous night at Manhattan Criminal Court. Also there at the courthouse is Daily Bugle reporter Ben Urick and his colleague, photographer Peter Parker. Ben tells Peter that one of the people that Matt is defending is a young kid uh, who is accused of murdering the pawnbroker from the previous night. Now this is something of a shock for Peter because as he says, if he was unable to pick out any one person in the crowd as the actual killer, how did the police, who didn't respond till moments later, the defendant, Juan Santiago, thinks he has the answer. He recently left a gang, and nobody leaves that gang without repercussions. So he claims that they have set him up. They claimed to have witnessed him shooting the pawnbroker. Listening to Juan's steady heartbeat as he protests he's innocent, Matt knows that he's telling the truth. But he's so busy dealing with all these cases that he can't change into his alter ego of daredevil to find evidence. So instead, the Black Widow says she will do it for him. Not only that, but Peter Parker, knowing that there is a miscarriage of justice looming, decides that he also will go and look for evidence. It doesn't take long for our two heroes' paths to cross and they decide to work together. Luckily, Spider-Man has already found out the location of the gang's hideout. And when the two of them enter, they don't just find the gang, but also some pretty incriminating evidence. Firstly, the gang are all sitting around watching TVs that they say they took from the pawnbroker's shop. Then, when Spider-Man and the Black Widow enter the room, one of them says to one of his uh, gang members, Hey man, you got the piece that did the job the other night. Use it on Spider-Man. So it sounds clear that these are the people they're looking for, and that gun is a vital piece of evidence. But the guy with the gun isn't hanging around, and as Spider-Man uh, races off after him, the Black Widow deals with the other gang members. The guy that Spidey is chasing quickly hijacks a car, taking as hostage a member of the petrified owner's family. The ensuing chase doesn't last long, as the gang member, distracted by the spider signal, veers off of the road, off of a bridge, and into the river. Spidey is quickly in the water to save both hostage and hostage taker, before diving back into the water to find the gun. As the Black Widow informs an attending police officer, that gun will provide vital evidence to clear Juan Santiago. But this comic isn't over yet. Because then we are told that the next day, Peter returns to Central Park again to have an intimate conversation with his friend Harry Osborne. Now this is a reference to events that happen in issue 251 of The Amazing Spider-Man that came out the same month as this comic. It also shows from a slightly different point of view, other events that happen in that comic. For example, Peter is hit by a massive warning uh, via his spider sense. The spider sense, remember, that has actually been nullified by the Hobgoblin's gas. He runs to find the source of this uh, incredible danger, which is coming itself from within Central Park. And changing into Spider-Man, he discovers the Beyonder's construct because this is the lead up to Spider-Man going off to join the Secret Wars. He's drawn towards it, he enters it, and vanishes. That's it, that's Spider-Man going off to fight in the Secret Wars. This is, to a degree, a comic book history in the making. And of course his life genuinely won't be the same afterwards. We still have one more page of this issue to go. 
although we won't see Spider-Man again, not until uh, the following month's issue, we check in back at Manhattan Criminal Court, where as quickly as Juan is informed that the police now have the pawnbroker's real killer, Ben Urich bursts through the door to inform them that someone at the police forensics lab has looked at the gun and they have confirmed that it is not the gun that killed the pawnbroker. So Juan is now back in the frame for his murder. Don't ever tell me that street level stories in comic books are boring, because this is a really good issue. Was the Black Widow's presence necessary? No, not at all. I think they could have just had a team up between Spider-Man and Matt Murdock, attorney at law. What a remarkable way to finish a pretty unremarkable 10 issues. With the Secret Wars stuff, I mean. The following 10 issues would feature more high profile guest stars and would begin with Spidey's return from Battleworld, complete with a cool new look.